Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students, welcome back to the Pericyclic Reactions online course. Okay. So before starting uh, the discussion for today's class, so we need to recollect what we have discussed in the previous class. So pericyclic reactions are defined as the concerted reactions which happens through a cyclic transition state within the same molecule. Okay. So R.B. Woodward who is a professor at Harvard University. Uh, he was working on the uh, stereochemistry of the steroid molecules. At that time, he observed that the particular stereoisomer is giving a particular stereoisomeric product based on the reaction conditions. That is either thermal condition or the photochemical condition. So, and he also observed that the isomer which uh, is uh, observed after the reaction is entirely different for the thermal conditions and for the photochemical conditions. Later, he started developing the new uh, course, a new uh, subject called pericyclic reactions. Okay. So, R.B. Woodward took help from the professor Hoffman, who is a professor at Cornell University. He is a theoretician. So, both together started understanding the new chemistry and developed uh, the new chemistry called as pericyclic reactions. So, later Hoffman along with uh, Fukai, Professor Fukai, who is uh, a professor at uh, Kyoto University. So, they further developed the uh, pericyclic reactions and those two were awarded the Nobel Prize in the year of 1981. These three scientists have developed the pericyclic reactions. Okay. Coming to the characteristics of the pericyclic uh, reactions, pericyclic reactions are only observed in the case of unsaturated systems like olefins and others. Okay. So, pericyclic reactions are concerted reactions. So, that means they happen, they, uh, they occur via the cyclic transition state only. So, pericyclic reactions never generate any charge on the product molecule. So, but if the starting material or the reactant molecule itself is having a charge, the pericyc after completion of the pericyclic reactions without disturbing this charge, so the product will also carry forward the same charge. Okay. So, there are no intermediates seen in the case of the pericyclic reactions such as ions or free radicals. So, it happens through a concerted cyclic transition state manner only. So, most of the pericyclic reactions are synchronous in nature. What do you mean by synchronous? So, rate of forward reaction will be equal to the rate of backward reaction. But, so this is not necessary for all the pericyclic reactions. So, there are exceptions now and then. Right. So, pericyclic reactions are induced by either thermal energy or by the photochemical energy. So, either under thermal conditions or under the photochemical conditions by inducing the molecule with a photon. So, you can perform the pericyclic reactions. Among these types of reactions, very few types are only unimolecular in nature. For example, electrocyclic reactions. Cycloaddition as you are involving two different molecules or more uh, molecules, so obviously it won't be an unimolecular reactions. Those which are intramolecular are unimolecular, for example, sigmatropic rearrangements and electrocyclic uh, reactions are only unimolecular, right? Cycloaddition reactions are unimolecular only if they are intramolecular. Diels Salder reaction between butadiene and malic anhydride is not an unimolecular reaction, it is a bimolecular reaction, right? So, that is the famous pericyclic reaction. And intramolecular Diels Salder reaction are in general intramolecular cycloaddition reactions are unimolecular, on the other hand, right? Coming to the next characteristic feature of the pericyclic reaction so, concentration versus rate of the pericyclic reaction, right? So, rate of intrama, intermolecular pericyclic reactions like cycloadditions will be concentration dependent, okay? Whereas, the rate of sigmatropic rearrangements and electrocyclic reactions are not concentration dependent. So, this point has to be remembered. So, extrusion reactions like helotropic reactions in one direction is intramolecular, 
and in the other direction it is intermolecular right so this has to be also noted so in general the rate of pericyclic reactions are not that sensitive to the electronic effects of the substituents as in the case of aromatic claisen rearrangement so in general the rate of reaction is not that sensitive to the polarity of the solvent also so either they are uh, stereo specific or stereo selective so pericyclic reactions are also reversible and the most important thing when you compare it with a normal organic reaction is pericyclic reactions are not influenced by the presence of a metal catalyst metal based catalyst or acid or a alkali and they are not influenced by any kind of catalyst are not inf influenced by the electrophile or a nucleophile and at the same time they are not influenced by the polarity of the solvent used okay so pericyclic reactions have these kind of specialities which put them a special kind of chemistry apart from the normal organic chemistry right so in further pericyclic reactions are classified into five types pericyclic reactions are classified into five types so the first one is electrocyclic reactions electrocyclic reactions okay so electrocyclic as discussed pericyclic reactions are reversible electrocyclic re reactions may be two types again one is electrocyclic ring closure and electrocyclic ring opening reactions okay so if you see an example where there is an unsaturated system and it is the butadiene molecule so this butadiene molecule is having the two pi bonds in conjugation with each other so when you give some kind of energy either in the form of thermal energy or in the form of light energy so this will transform into a cyclic molecule which is here cyclobutene cyclobutene so this forward reaction is treated as electrocyclic ring closure ring closure where the open chain molecule is transformed into a cyclic molecule closed chain molecule or cyclic molecule by the reorganization of the pi electrons reorganization of the pi electrons so the reverse of this is called as electrocyclic ring opening reactions electrocyclic ring opening reaction and the forward one is electrocyclic ring closure reaction so how this transformation is happening via the involvement of the pi electrons via the involvement of the pi electrons and as a result of which a cyclic transition state is formed because the pi electrons are reorganizing themselves and at the expense of one of the two pi bonds at the expense of one of the two pi bonds a sigma bond is generated so you can see here there are two pi bonds this one and this one but here there is a one pi bond and a newly formed sigma bond newly formed sigma bond what is happening means one of the pi bond is slowly converting into a sigma bond and the other pi bond is changing its position you can see the cyclic reorganization happening through this cyclic transition state cyclic transition state so all the pericyclic reactions unlike the normal organic reactions will occur in a single step will occur in a single step okay so via the cyclic transition state so the next type of pericyclic reaction is cyclo additions similar to electrocyclic reactions cyclo addition reactions are also of two different types one is cyclo addition 
where the two individual unsaturated systems are reorganizing with the help of the pi electrons and forming a cyclic molecule. So, so two individuals are adding with each other via the reorganization of the pi electrons that is via the cyclic transition state giving you a single cyclic molecule that is cycloaddition reaction. Whereas the other reaction is a cyclic molecule via the same cyclic uh, transition state is giving you the two different unsaturated systems which is called as cycloreversion reactions which is called as cycloreversion reaction. So, the example here you can take is butadiene molecule adding with an ethylene molecule. So, in the forward reaction what is happening means the pi electrons are reorganizing such that it results in the formation of a cyclic adduct molecule. So, what is happening here? This is happening, right. So, if you see here, there are three pi bonds which are involved in the reaction. Of course, they are from the different individuals, but they have transformed into a single cyclic adduct molecule where you can observe the formation of two new sigma bonds, two new sigma bonds at the expense of two pi bonds from these starting materials you have produced two sigma bonds in the product. So, this is a cycloaddition reaction. So, the reverse of this reaction is called as cycloreversion, cycloreversion. Both of them happens through a cyclic transition state. Both of them are happening through a cyclic transition state. So, the opposite is the cycloreversion and the forward is the cycloaddition reaction. So, next one is sigma tropic reactions. So, tropic E means migration, tropic means migration. What is migrating means a sigma bond. What is migrating here in this case is a sigma bond. So, for such kind of reactions to be considered as a pericyclic reaction, the sigma bond should be in connection with a pi bond. The best example you can see here is an allylic molecule. So, there is a pi bond and there is a sigma bond which is in connection with the pi bond and the adjacent carbon atom. So, this is the sigma bond. Here at one corner of the sigma bond, there may be a hydrogen atom or there may be any group. So, what happens here is this particular sigma bond will change its position. So, if you number this 1, 2, 3, so the sigma bond which is at the allylic position, the sigma bond which is at the allylic position will slowly transform into this one. This is 1, 2 and 3. So, yeah. So, if you can closely observe this, what is happening with the help of the pi bond, this sigma bond is slowly migrating to this place and one should remember like, so though it is involving the sigma bond here, it happens via a cyclic transition state, it happens via a cyclic transition state. So, the next one is kilotropic reactions. kilotropic reaction. So, it is another kind of pericyclic reaction which is almost similar to the cycloaddition reactions, but the major difference between the kilotropic kind of reactions and the normal cycloaddition reaction is that the kilotropic reaction involves a single group or an atom to form a cyclic adduct. It involves a single group or an atom as one of the reactant molecule, as one of the reactant molecule in order to generate a cyclic molecule. So, the example is this. So, if you have an unsaturated system like ethylene which is the simplest unsaturated system and if there is an atom like carbene, 
what is happening now? Now, this carbene is involved in the cyclization of this molecule, cyclization of this molecule. What will you get here? So, we will get a cyclic molecule like this R and R, right. So, if you clearly observe the difference here, in the case of cycloaddition reactions, two individual pi molecules are involving and as a resultant of this, it is generating two new sigma bonds. Here in kilotropic reactions, so one pi individual, a pi reactant molecule is adding up with a single atom center, which is also capable of forming a sigma bond. Here also, there are two new sigma bonds formed in the product. So, this is also reversible in nature. So, as discussed, almost all the cyclo, uh, sorry, pericyclic reactions are reversible in nature, okay. So, the last one is the group transfer reactions. So, group transfer reactions. So, in this, a group or groups will migrate from one place to the another place via the cyclic transition state. So, that is called as the group transfer reaction. So, group transfer reaction is the last type of pericyclic reactions, is another type of pericyclic reactions where you can clearly see that a single group or groups migrating or transferring from one place to the another place via a concerted manner, via a concerted manner. For example, if you take this one, so for uh, group transfer reactions, look at this example, where this pi bond, if it is changing its position in order to form a new sigma bond between these two carbon atoms, this pi bond is migrating here. At the same time, this hydrogen will go here, resulting in the formation of a new molecule this way, right. So, this hydrogen has changed the position, so which comes under the category group transfer reactions. So, after understanding the different types of pericyclic reactions, it is now time to uh, know about the analysis methods of pericyclic reactions. There are three methods of analyzing a pericyclic reaction, three methods of analyzing a pericyclic reaction, okay. So, the first one is orbital symmetry correlation method. So, the first one is orbital symmetry correlation method. So, this orbital symmetry correlation method is also called as conservation of symmetry of orbitals method. So, it is also called as conservation of symmetry of orbitals. Okay. So, this uh, orbital symmetry correlation method was first developed by R.B. Woodward and Hoffman. Later, the advanced mode of this orbital symmetry correlation method is developed by Higgins and Abrahamson. So, it was developed by Professor R.B. Woodward and Hoffman. Later, it was taken forward by Professor Higgins and Abrahamson. So, the second method is frontier molecular orbital method. So, which is also called as FMO approach, which is also called as 
FMO approach or it is also called as homo lumo approach. Okay. So, this uh, analysis is again developed by R.B. Woodward and Hoffman. So, the other method of analyzing the pericyclic reaction is transition state aromaticity method. So, the other method which is in existence method which is also called as PMO perturbational molecular orbital theory. So, it is again developed by uh, Divar and Zimmerman. So, this method was developed by Divar and Zimmerman. Okay. So, now we have three different uh, methods for analyzing the pericyclic reaction. The first one is orbital symmetry correlation method which is also called as the conservation of symmetry of orbitals approach and it was entirely developed by R. B. Woodward and Hoffman. Later some contributions was given by Professor Higgins and Abrahamson. So, the second method the most popular method is the frontier molecular orbital theory method which is in short form is called as FMO method and are also called as homo lumo approach. Okay. It is also again developed by R. B. Woodward and Hoffman. So, the third method for analyzing the pericyclic reactions is the transition state aromaticity method or perturbational molecular orbital theory method. So, it was developed by Divar and Zimmerman. Okay. So, as FMO is the most popular method and the easiest method to analyze the pericyclic reactions or do analysis of the pericyclic reactions using any of these three methods existing methods one should have a thorough knowledge about the molecular orbitals and their symmetry properties molecular orbitals and their symmetry properties let us start with some basics in understanding the molecular orbitals so we will start from lcao method to gain some insights into the molecular orbitals so we start with lcao method so, LCAO method means linear combination of atomic orbitals. So, what it is saying means the atomic orbitals are linearly combining with each other. Okay. So, what happens when the atomic orbitals combine with each other? So, there are two modes of combination. One is the additive combination and the other one is the subtractive combination. Right. So, if atomic orbitals are combining with each other, they result in the formation of a new set of orbitals, the result in the formation of a new set of orbitals. Those new orbitals are now treated as molecular orbitals, are treated as molecular orbitals. The atomic orbitals will represent only the atoms, whereas the molecular orbitals will represent the entire molecule, which is formed because of the combination of the atoms, right. So, the atomic orbitals are undergoing linear combination. So, linear combination of atomic orbitals will result in the formation of, so A O means atomic orbitals, will result in the formation of molecular orbitals. So, linear combination of atomic orbitals will result in the formation of the molecular orbitals. So, the number of atomic orbitals combining, so e, number of atomic orbitals combining will be exactly equal to the number of new molecular orbitals produced. So, the number of atomic orbitals combining will be equal to the number of molecular orbitals generated. And the energy of atomic orbitals will be always higher when compared to the some of the molecular orbitals which are produced and 
we call them as bonding molecular orbitals. That means the atomic orbitals which are combining to give you the molecular orbitals are three types. One is the bonding molecular orbitals BMO, the other is non-bonding molecular orbitals NBMO and the one more uh, molecular orbital is anti-bonding molecular orbital ABMO. So, the combination of atomic orbitals can lead to the formation of three different types of the uh, molecular orbitals. The one is bonding molecular orbital, anti-bonding molecular orbital and the third category is non-bonding molecular orbitals. Okay. So, the bonding molecular orbitals will have less energy and higher stability. Non-bonding molecular orbitals will be having the energy equal to the atomic orbitals and anti-bonding molecular orbitals will have high amounts of energy and they are less stable. For the bond formation, the bonding molecular orbitals are responsible. So, bonding molecular orbitals are responsible for the formation of the bonds. Okay. If n number of atomic orbitals are adding with each other, it results in the formation of n number of molecular orbitals. So, that is what we have discussed. What if the number of atomic orbitals n is even in number? So, if n is equal to even, so then, then n by 2 bonding molecular orbitals will be and remaining n by 2 will be anti bonding. Okay. So, if the number of atomic orbitals combining is even in number, so then n by 2 will be bonding molecular orbitals, the remaining n by 2 will be anti bonding molecular orbitals. If n is odd number, so for example, 3 atomic orbitals are mixing with each other. So, that means odd number of atomic orbitals are mixing with each other, for example, 3, then n minus 1 by 2 will be bonding molecular orbitals and the remaining n minus 1 by 2 will be anti bonding molecular orbital. The leftover 1 will be non bonding molecular orbital. You see, if it is A1, you will get only bonding molecular orbital and anti bonding molecular orbital. If the odd number of atomic orbitals are mixing with each other, then n minus 1 by 2 will be bonding, n minus 1 by 2 will be anti bonding, the remaining 1 will be the non bonding molecular orbital. So, if you if you compare the energy, if you compare the energy of the molecular orbitals formed, so, the energy of the bonding molecular orbital BMO will be less than the energy of the non-bonding molecular orbital and it is still less than energy of the anti-bonding molecular orbital. Okay. So, anyhow we are getting new molecular orbitals and the molecular orbitals produced are designated as psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, so on psi n. So, if only one molecular orbital is generated, it is psi 1, the first molecular orbital, second molecular orbital is psi 2, psi 3, psi 4, psi 5, so on up to psi n we can get based on the number of atomic orbitals combining with each other, right. Yeah. So, here also when you compare the energy, the energy of psi 1 molecular orbital will be less than energy of psi 2 molecular orbital which is less than energy of psi 3 molecular orbital, so on the energy of psi n molecular orbital. Okay. So, the energy of the molecular orbital will also be in the following order. So, the uh, lowest uh, molecular orbital will have the lowest energy and highest stability. So, the, as the number increases, as the number increases, so the stability decreases and energy automatically increases for that particular molecular orbital. So, one thing we need to also recollect is node. So, what do you mean by a node? Yeah. So, node is a point where the
probability of finding an electron is almost 0, right. So, the molecular orbitals after forming will also have some nodes. So, how do you get the number of nodes? How do you get the number of nodes? So, if this is the number of the molecular orbital, then this minus 1 will give you the number of nodes. For example, for the first molecular orbital, there are 0 nodes. So, nodes will be like this. The first molecular orbital n is equal to 1 and it is 0, 1 minus 1 is 0. So, n minus 1 nodes will be there for the molecular orbitals, right. For the second molecular orbital, the n is 2, therefore 2 minus 1 is 1. So, you can see one node in the case of the second molecular orbital. For the third one, the n is 3 and you can see two number of nodes. You can see the number of nodes as 2. Uh, so on for the nth molecular orbital, you can see n minus 1 number of nodes, n minus 1 number of nodes, right. So, this is also indicating that as the number of nodes is increasing, as the number of nodes is increasing, the energy of that particular molecular orbital is also increasing, okay. So, number of nodes is directly proportional to the energy of the molecular orbital. How it can be seen means, if two s orbitals are combining with each other, so if this is one s orbital and it is having another s orbital and if two s orbitals are combining with each other, that will give you a bonding molecular orbital and anti-bonding molecular orbital, right. So, because two atomic orbitals are combining with each other, as a result of which you will get two molecular orbitals. Out of that, as the number of orbitals combining is odd number, even number, sorry. So, you will get n by 2 as the bonding molecular orbitals and n by 2 as the anti-bonding molecular orbitals. One will be bonding and one will be anti-bonding molecular orbital. So, in the unsaturated systems like olefins, you can see two different types of bonds. One is the carbon to carbon sigma bond, the carbon to hydrogen sigma bond. So, these two are the sigma bonds and along with these two sig types of sigma bonds, you can also see a carbon to carbon pi bond, okay. So, if you want to see the molecular orbitals formed for these type of bonds. So, let us see now the carbon to hydrogen sigma bond. So, carbon to hydrogen sigma bond is formed here in the, the carbon is sp3 hybridized for example. So, it is having an sp3 hybridized orbital, it is having an sp3 hybridized orbital. So, the hydrogen is using its s orbital, this is s orbital and this is the hybridized orbital. So, what you can see here is the formation of two new molecular orbitals one is the bonding molecular orbital. So, this is positive and this is negative. So, this is because of the combination of the positive wave function of the p orbital with the positive s orbital. So, this results in the formation of a bonding molecular orbital whose energy will be very less and it is highly stable. Whereas, in the other case, if the negative wave function of the orbital is mixing with the s orbital, p orbital is mixing with the s orbital, what you can see is, so this is minus, this is plus and this is plus. So, this is an anti-bonding molecular orbital, this is an anti-bonding molecular orbital. Similarly, for the pi bond of uh, sigma bond formation, carbon carbon sigma bond formation, two hybridized p orbitals are mixing with each other. So, this is the p orbital of one carbon atom and this is the p orbital of another carbon atom. If they combine with each other, they result in the formation of minus plus plus minus. So, this is the 
bonding molecular orbital for C C sigma bond. C C sigma bond. Right. So, the same way if it is adding in an opposite direction, you will get this. So, this is an anti bonding molecular orbital for C C sigma bond. Right. So, one thing we can observe here is in the bonding molecular orbital, the maximum electron density is located in between the nuclei, in between the nuclei, so of the two uh, participating atoms. Whereas, here least electron density is seen in the case of the antibonding molecular orbital. So, the uh, uh, location of the highest electron density in between the two nuclei is responsible for the higher stability of the bonding molecular orbital and it is responsible uh, the lowest electron density in between these two is responsible for the lower stability of the antibonding molecular orbital. Similarly, carbon carbon can also involve in the pi bonding as we are dealing with the unsaturated systems it also involves in the pi bonding right. So, C C pi bond. So, pi bonds are resultant of the lateral overlapping of the p orbitals, lateral overlapping of the p orbitals. So, if one p orbital of this carbon atom is overlapping with the other p orbital of the other carbon atom. So, the additive combination will give you the bonding molecular orbital. So, if this is the internuclear axis, so you can see the electron density accumulating above and below the internuclear axis for a bonding molecular orbital. So, this is the bonding molecular orbital, pi bonding molecular orbital. Okay. So, if they are adding with each other in a subtractive mode, so then you will get this one. So, plus, minus, minus, plus, right. So, definitely there will be the observance of a node at the center, right. So, if this is the internuclear axis, you can see the electron density is not clear either above the internuclear axis or below the internuclear axis. So, this becomes the antibonding molecular orbital of the pi bond. This is the pi antibonding molecular orbital. Yeah. So, now let us construct the pi molecular orbitals for the unsaturated molecules. So, the simplest unsaturated molecule is ethene molecule. So, CH2 double bond CH2 it is the simplest uh, unsaturated molecule which can participate in the pericyclic reactions. So, if you see this molecule, you can observe that there are two numbers of sp2 carbon atoms. So, how many sp2 carbon atoms are there? So, two numbers of sp2 carbon atoms are there, right. So, these two carbon atoms will utilize their p orbitals for the formation of the pi molecular orbital. Therefore, so, each p orbital from each carbon atom is contributed for the formation of the molecular orbitals. So, the number of atomic orbitals involved here, number of atomic orbitals involved here is 2. Therefore, obviously, we should get number of new molecular orbitals also as 2, right. Yeah. So, now let us start and analyze the molecular orbitals, pi molecular orbitals of ethylene molecule. You see that the p orbitals are this way. So, two pi um, atomic orbitals are involved to form two molecular orbitals. So, that means, so this one, name them as psi 1 which is the lowest molecular orbital having higher stability and lower energy and the next one is psi 2. If you see the energy, so the energy will be increasing with the increase in the molecular orbital number. So, this is energy, right. And 
we have to see the number of nodes formed, right. So, number of nodes is equal to number of nodes is equal to n minus 1, right. So, here the n is 1. So, 1 minus 1 will be 0, 0 number of nodes will be there, right. And here there will be 1 node, 1 node for the psi 2 molecular orbital, okay. So, now coming to the symmetry of this pi molecular orbitals. So, the odd number molecular orbital will have the same wave function on the lobes of the p orbital on either side at the termini, at the termini. So, it should have same wave function if it is an odd number molecular orbital, okay. So, if it is an even number molecular orbital, it should have opposite wave function on the terminal lobes of the unsaturated system, terminal lobes of the unsaturated system. If you see this, so this is the simplest unsaturated system which is an alkene ethylene molecule. So, you can see these two carbon atoms are sp2 hybridized carbon atoms and between these two carbon atoms you have a pi bond where the electron delocalization is above and below the internuclear axis, right. So, this is the pi bond. But before forming this pi bond, how it looks like? Before forming this pi bond, the ethylene molecule looks like this. So, this is the sp2 carbon atom and this is another sp2 carbon atom. They have initially a sigma bond at the center, right. So, this is the unhybridized p orbital and this is also the unhybridized p orbital. So, same for this carbon atom. Let us assume that, so this blue colored one is the positive wave function of the p orbital and the pink color one is the negative wave function of the orbital, okay. So, if the wave functions are same here, they will go for additive uh, uh, mixing and results in the formation of the bonding molecular orbital, right. So, if the wave functions are different here, so you can now see the negative wave function is trying to mix with the positive wave function. So, then subtractive mode of combination takes place and it gives you the anti-bonding molecular orbital, it gives you the anti-bonding molecular orbital. Say for the bonding molecular orbital, so this is the bonding molecular orbital you are seeing here, this is the psi 1 molecular orbital, right. So, the wave functions on the top are same and the wave functions below the internuclear axis is also same, right. So, in this point, in this point, so this molecular orbital will exhibit some symmetry conditions, will say, will show some symmetry, right. So, if you cover the half of the uh, molecule, so still you are able to imagine the other half here. If you clearly observe, so the both the sides are same. If you cut this molecule into two equal halves or if you cover this with a mirror, still you can imagine the other half of the molecule. That means this particular molecular orbital is showing the mirror plane of symmetry, is showing the mirror plane of symmetry or which is also called as sigma plane of symmetry. So, this particular molecular orbital is going to show you the sigma plane of symmetry. Okay. I am just putting it as sigma, it is showing the mirror plane of symmetry. Coming to this one, so this is the internuclear axis and hold the molecule with uh, something which is perpendicular to the internuclear axis, which is perpendicular to the internuclear axis and make rotations such that you will see the same identical after certain degrees of rotation. So, if this is there, on complete 360 degrees of rotation, it is giving me the identical thing, right. So, that means the C is, it has C1 axis of symmetry, 
c1 axis of symmetry but it is not having any other axis of symmetry it is having a c1 axis of symmetry that means on complete 360 degrees rotation only you can get the identical right so if you are examining the second molecular orbital which is the antibonding molecular orbital here the wave functions are different so positive wave function on my left side and the negative wave function on my right side right so if i cover half of this can you get the same identical of course no right so this is not having sigma plane of symmetry the sigma plane of symmetry in this is not seen whereas in the case of psi 1 molecular orbital the sigma plane of symmetry is seen and c2 axis of symmetry in the plane of the first uh, molecular orbital is not seen now let us examine this one for the c2 axis of symmetry so this is the molecule and by holding the internuclear axis i am just rotating it to see where i can get the identical position so on rotation of 180 degrees i got the identical position right so within 360 degrees how many times you are getting the identical position is denoted by the number there so how many times i will get the identical position so if this is one on 180 degrees i am getting the same position so where the negative wave function is towards my right and the positive wave function is towards my left and again rotating it for one more 180 degrees that means completion of 360 degrees i can see one more identical i can see one more identical so how many times am i able to see this identical uh, position on rotation about 360 degrees means two times so this antibonding molecular orbital is having c2 axis of symmetry but not sigma plane of symmetry whereas this pi, mole uh, pi molecular or bonding molecular orbital which is psi 1 so it is showing sigma plane of symmetry but not c2 axis of symmetry so if you want to see similar kind of molecular orbitals for butadiene so this is a butadiene molecule where the number of sp2 carbon atoms number of sp2 carbon atoms is 4 so the number of molecular orbitals you will be getting is also 4 because each carbon atom is contributing one atomic orbital so therefore the number of molecular orbitals you will be observing is also equal to 4 right so if this is the energy order you will have the lowest energy for psi 1 molecular orbital next psi 2 next psi 3 and next psi 4 right so as discussed what we have understood the odd number molecular orbital should have the same sign on the termini of the pi molecular orbital the even number molecular orbital will have the opposite sign on the terminal of the molecular orbital so let us draw this 2 3 and 4 so this is the internuclear axis and for this so this is the internuclear axis so these are the four pi molecular orbitals so what is there for the odd number molecular orbital so you should have the same sign for the even number molecular orbital you should have the different sign yes coming to the number of nodes so how do you calculate the number of nodes it is n minus 1 right so what is the n for this first molecular orbital it is 1 so then 1 minus 1 is 0 so there are no nodes so that means the wave function should be same the wave function should be same on above the internuclear axis and 
below the internuclear axis. So, then only you will not see any node. So, you can never see a node if the wave functions above and below the internuclear axis is exactly same, right. So, for psi 2, the number of nodes is 1. For psi 3, the number of nodes will be 2. For psi 4, the number of nodes will be 3, right. So, now coming to the symmetry operations. So, then we can complete the molecular orbitals, okay. So, this psi 1 molecular orbital which is having 0 nodes will show sigma plane of symmetry, will show sigma plane of symmetry, right. So, if you have any doubt, you can see that. What is happening? If you can cover this half or you can cut this half, still with the help of a mirror, you can imagine the other half, right. So, it has mirror plane of symmetry, it has mirror plane of symmetry. But if you hold this at the center of the internuclear axis and I rotate it 180 degrees, what is happening? If I rotate this 180 degrees, all this minus will come on the top and this plus will go on the bottom. Is it identical? No. So, at C2 uh, rotation, it is not giving any identical thing. So, that is why it is not having C2 axis of symmetry. C2 axis is not present, whereas sigma plane is present. Come to this one. This should have a 1 and this one is having a C2 axis of symmetry. Psi 2 is having C2 axis of symmetry, right. How do you get C2 axis of symmetry? So, hold this and rotate by 180 degrees. This positive lobe will be replaced by this positive lobe, is not it? So, if you rotate it by 180 degrees, what is happening? I am getting the positive on this side only. So, on another 180 degrees, again positive on this side only, right. That means, two times you are getting the identical upon rotation around 360 degrees. So, therefore, it has C2 axis of symmetry, it has C2 axis of symmetry, but it should not have a sigma plane of symmetry, it should not have a sigma plane of symmetry. That means, this. See now, there is one node coming in between these two, right. So, this is positive wave function and this is negative wave function. So, because of this, you can see a node at the center here. One node is there and now, if you cut this, you will not get the identical, right. So, mirror plane of symmetry is not there. So, sigma plane is not there and if you hold it here and rotate it by 180 degrees centigrade, 180 degrees, so you will get if you hold it here and rotate by 180 degrees, so you will get the same wave function. So, it is showing C2 axis of symmetry, right. Similarly, this one, there should be two nodes and it should have sigma plane of symmetry and it should not show C2 axis of symmetry, right. So, then two nodes will come here and here. So, what is happening now? See. If you cut bisect it to halves, you can still see the mirror image. So, this is having sigma plane of symmetry. If you hold it at the axis and then start rotating it, so what happens? This is negative wave function on rotation about 180 degrees. So, this negative will come here and positive will go here. So, is it identical? Of course, no. So, then it is not having C2 axis of symmetry. So, come to this one. So, psi 4 molecular orbital, it should have 3 nodes. So, the 3 nodes will come here, right. And as this is an even number molecular orbital, this should not have C2 axis, sorry, sigma plane of uh, symmetry and it should have C2 axis of symmetry. So, C2 axis means, so here is the positive wave function. So, if you hold it, and rotate it uh, for 180 degrees, so you will get the same identical thing, 
So, it is having C2 axis. So, if you cut it, you should not get the mirror plane, right. So, plus minus. See, three nodes are there. It is not having sigma plane of symmetry and it is not showing C2 axis of symmetry. So, similarly, we can construct the molecular orbitals, pi molecular orbitals for 1 comma 3 comma 5 hexa triene, which is an even number molecular orbital containing molecule, okay. So, we can also do that for the odd number of uh, sp2 carbon atoms containing systems. So, that we will see in the next class. Thank you.